Christ Church is more than just another relic in Philadelphia's historical district. Not only does this 18th century building stand today, but it continues to offer services every Sunday as it did when some of our favorite founding fathers worshiped there. In honor of maintaining history, the way Christ Church continues to do, we're preparing a very special menu honoring Christ Church and Hannah Glass. On today's menu, we're making a Florentine of veal kidney, a traditional sauerbraten, potato cake, and we're finishing it off with a traditional blanc mange, all for a taste of history. As you may imagine, I spent a lot of time re researching recipes from the 18th century. Many of those recipes are inspired or written or documented by Hannah Glass. Her book was published in 1745. This particular recipe today took me for a real surprise. The name of the dish, as she has it documented in her cookbook, calls it a Florentine of veal. A lot of culinarians will say, even anybody watching the show, where is the spinach? <laughs> well, there is no spinach. Because normally Florentine, by everybody's standard, means an incorporating of spinach. I assume because it uses orange water, and oranges came from Florence all the way up to London. I assume that's why she named it Florentine. In any case, it's her name, it's her recipe, and I'm interpreting it her way, exactly like she did. Having said it, this is a real kidney. Normally, if you would see a real kidney at a butcher shop, you would see it most likely completely peeled, meaning the fat would be peeled off it. But Hannah Glass's recipe, which is what's unique about this entire dish, and what got me so inspired, is that she wants the kidney to be minced or finely chopped with the fat on it. So the way it works is, you take the kidney, you leave some fat on it, you gotta obviously trim it down a little bit, because too much fat wouldn't be good either. And she calls it minced or chopped fine, would be like about so. Now, I'm seasoning it up. I have mace. The mace is the outer membrane of a nutmeg nut. Corn cloves. Currants, black currants. The currants you don't have to soak. You can, but you don't have to. Lots of nutmeg. A little salt in here. Not too much. And pepper. And now I've got to chop up some candied lemon peel. You can chop it any way you want. And now comes two interesting ingredients, hard-boiled egg yolk. Chop that. Just a rough chop, like so. Now we add it into my bowl. So I get this question asked so many times when people old, read an old 18th century recipe book, what is a peepin? And what a peepin is, is an apple. And basically, all you want to do is peel the apple. Now, I grew up in the Black Forest, post-war, not lots of money, we can figure it out. Apple peels like that would be hung to dry, maybe near a fireplace, like here, all together whole, like that. And this later became candy for us kids. Imagine that. It's really sweet and very delicious. And for this recipe, I would recommend use Granny Smith because they're more tart. Works extremely well. Now we just take it. All right. Now comes orange water. It's orange blossom that gets picked when the oranges bloom and then you put it in water until it takes the flavor, like rose water. My baking dish, any baking dish you can use, I found this to be more ideal because remember, long cooking time. So that has two sheets of puff dough in it. I'm adding salad breadcrumbs to the bottom, and the reason for that is it will assist when it all cooks together to absorb some of the extra liquid. Now I'm adding the filling that you see me make earlier. Now I'm topping it off with breadcrumbs. I fold the flaps over. Cut nice and rustic. 
And now I'm going to egg wash it. And then it goes in the oven behind me at about 350. If you cook it for an hour and a half, maybe one hour with the lid, and the other half hour without the lid, so it gets nice and crusty. So this goes like so, and it goes in the beehive behind me. While my veal kidney is in the oven cooking away, let's find out more about Christchurch in Old City, Philadelphia. Christ Church is neither the largest nor the oldest historic church building in Philadelphia, but it is very, very important because it was the first Church of England parish in Pennsylvania. When Charles II, King of England, granted the charter to William Penn for Pennsylvania, the king insisted that the charter include that if 24 Anglicans wanted a Church of England parish, that there was to be one and Pennsylvania was to be a place of religious liberty. Established in 1695, Philadelphia's Christ Church soon played host to some of America's most iconic historical figures, including George Washington, Betsy Ross, and John Adams. The building itself is considered to be a fine example of Georgian architecture, capturing the essence of a style that originated in early 18th century Europe. Another exceptional figure in the legacy of Christ Church was William White, who admirably served the parish for nearly six decades. William White was an Anglican clergyman in the Church of England at the time of the American Revolution, and he was an assistant here at Christ Church. He became the rector of the parish, and he was one of the very few Anglican clergymen left in America during the Revolution. Despite his sworn oath to the king, White supported the colony's attempt for American independence and remained in the colonies in hopes of keeping the church together. William White was the, ultimately the first bishop of the new Protestant Episcopal Church in America and the first bishop of the Diocese of Pennsylvania. One of White's most famous parishioners was Philadelphia's own Benjamin Franklin. It was Franklin's financial efforts that afforded Christ Church with its illustrious steeple, which was North America's tallest structure at the time of its completion in 1754. The steeple was not only a very visible beacon for ships on the river and for people on the streets, it was a place that notable Americans wanted to visit. And John Adams, for one, when he came to Philadelphia to be in the Continental Congress, asked to go up the steeple. He wanted to visit the tallest place in North America and get a view of the city. Christ Church has been holding worship since 1695 and continues today as an active parish in the Diocese of Pennsylvania in the Episcopal Church. This is not a museum, it's a living church, but we receive tens of thousands of tourists every year because of Christ Church's place in 18th century Philadelphia and the American Revolution. So now the main course of this menu in honor of Christ Church, and we make it a sauerbraten. Now, a sauerbraten is made, I, I, I couldn't even describe how many different ways. The basic principle, however, is always the same. What kind of meat you're going to buy, that's the only difference. So today I have in front of me a prime chuck. The more marbling, the better the sauce, the better the flavor. I'll take a slice like what so, that later would serve about eight to ten people. Now comes the most important part, it's the marinade. So the marinade, if you don't like a mirepoix, you don't really have to, just adds more flavor into it. A little onion, carrot, a little bit of celery root. You can put a little celery stock in it. The pickling spice that you buy ready-made in any store, which is a variety of mustard seed, bay leaf, all mixed together. You have juniper berries that I crush them, so it releases the flavor. Juniper berry is where chin is made out of, so it has this huge, unbelievable flavor. Oh, unbelievable. A little bit of ginger. Not a lot, just a little bit of ginger in there. Some people put it in, some people don't. Bay leaf, obviously lucky ones to have fresh ones today. So now comes the important part, which is the vinegar. White vinegar you use when you make my recipe. Many people use red wine vinegar. I don't because I use well red wine. So I put a good amount of vinegar. And then try red wine again. I wouldn't use a red wine 
that I wouldn't drink. Even so, we're gonna discard the marinade. So then I go like that, completely. Some people peppercorn, some people don't. I like a little pepper, but no salt. And the reason that no salt goes in there because salt is a dehumidifier. It would make your meat dry. But crushed pepper could be perfect flavor. Now what you wanna do, you wanna turn this over. Now it goes in your refrigerator up to a week. The longer you refrigerate it, the more of the flavor of the vinegar, the wine, and the herbs will penetrate the meat. The more flavor you get later. Where I come from, this is a Sunday meal, if there ever was one. Let's go to the archives of Christ Church to discover the many treasures they house there, including my favorite, a misprint on a Bible that inspired my sour pardon. I do declare that I will conform to the liturgy of the Church of England as it is now by law established. Christ Church has an absolutely wonderful history and as you well know, Walter, it goes all the way back to 1695. In 1720, the belfry was in such bad shape that they knew they had to do something to fix it and they decided it was time to build a bigger church. They started the plans, presumably around that little one initially, so that service could continue as they went along the way. And so they needed to come up with a novel way of raising money for the steeple, and so they went to a lottery. And here we have an example of one of those early lottery tickets. And you can see just by the number, 7493, they must have issued quite a number of these in order to meet their goal. One of the ways in which they um, hoped to fund operations of the church was to rent pews. Wow. This gives us a wonderful sense of who sat where mm -hmm. and who their neighbors might be and how many seats there were. So for example, again, going back to our favorite Benjamin Franklin, we see him over here in pew 59 and he rented three seats. Mm -hmm. Continental Congress was meeting here in Philadelphia in 1774. So I guess it's not surprising that what happened, you know, as this Declaration of Independence was being readied, is that the vestry, who were probably well connected to this whole effort, directed the rector in 1775 to omit the prayers to the king in the Book of Common Prayer. It's interesting, the commitment uh, the clergymen had to have to support the revolution because they're playing with their life. It was an act of treason. This is a Bible that was printed in London in 1717, and it was known as a basket full of errors because there are so many typos in this particular book. And the most noticeable one was the parable of the vineyards, translated to the parable of, of the, the vinegar. vinegar. So if they never would correct the, the vinegar in the, in the actual text, it would have been kind of funny because they wouldn't say, then say the Lord of the vinegar, what should I do? <laughs> Yes, luckily it only shows up once. <laughs> so Carol, thank you very much for showing me your archives. It was a pleasure, Walter. Thank you. All this talk about vinegar and vineyards, I already made this great dish. It's called sauerkraut that uses vinegar and wine. So here is the marinated sauerkraut. This has been one week in the refrigerator and you can see how discolored the meat is now. There are many recipe books and many cookbooks that will tell you to boil the marinade and use it in the sauce. I always recommend against it. I always say, discard it. You're spending this much time on a great meal. I don't want you to ever have a chance for bacteria to grow in there. Even so, technically they wouldn't grow in there because of the amount of vinegar. To be on the safe side, we discard it. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna salt it now because it's gonna go right in the pan and put a little pepper on it. Same thing over here. And then behind me I have a Dutch eagle nice and hot. I'm searing it real good, now I'm gonna turn it. The flavor that comes out of that, spectacular flavor. Now I'm adding in the mirepoix, which is basically carrots, celery, and a little onion. 
Now I'm going to deglaze that with red wine. And now the sauerbraten can go to the oven, can be slowly on the fire. It'll take at least about an hour slowly cooking because this beef gets completely eaten well done. So it's like a, a pot roast with vinegar. I like to serve potato cakes next to my sauerbraten. Many people serve noodles or mashed potato. It's a little different. So basically what I have to do, I got to boil potatoes and I squeeze the potatoes cooked. And by the way, what you want to make sure when you do that, that your potatoes are really dry. By dry meaning after you cook them, you want to stick them back in the oven to evaporate the liquid. Some salt, you get some good amount of nutmeg. And I get some chives. You want to mix it really good. Gets just a couple of egg yolks. Take a little flour in your hand and you roll it and then what you want to do is you form it. Put a little extra flour on them. All I got to do is put some butter in my skillet behind me. Butter and oil. The butter is for the flavor and the oil lets you get the temperature up. So you want to just cook them until they're golden brown. And when they're golden brown, they're heated on the inside. Chives on top of that. So now it's the time to pick up my kidney pie. Hannah Glass's favorite dish and mine as well. Remember, cook them without the lid for an hour, and then maybe the last half an hour with the lid. Oh, wow. What a piece. Renaissance here. Look at that. Some lemon veggies, some fresh parsley. I want to thank Hannah for this fantastic recipe. Great flavor. Hard to believe this recipe was written in 1745. All right, now is the world famous sour bun. Oh, that baby looks good. You see how beautiful the marbling? It's actually very similar to a brisket that everybody knows, but like all the barbecues they're doing, except this one happens to be a couple of hundred years older. Well, let me put a sauce on top, and this meal can be served. Well, it gets a nice sprig of parsley. So this is my sour pardon. Here we have Hannah Glass's favorite kidney pie and some potato cakes, but we're not done. We're gonna make a spectacular dessert that revolutionized the 18th century. You hear those bells? Those are the same bells that ushered in America's freedom in 1776. Walter, when you're walking in here, what you're seeing is the confidence of an emerging Philadelphia. It's so amazing stepping back this many years and feeling yeah. it, you know. Let me show you the pew of President George Washington. This is the seat he would have utilized when he was President of the United States. Many of the Founding Fathers, more than we can actually put plaques on, were here for services. Above the President's pew is the seal of William of Orange. And if you look carefully at it, you can see the vandalism that was done to it during the Revolution, in which mobs went through the city of Philadelphia looking for symbols of royal authority. This is a symbol of the rage of the people in some ways. So Neil, it wasn't just them destroying property, right? No, they're making a political statement. Walter, let me show you another one of the treasures of Christ Church. It is a baptistry, a font that was made perhaps as long ago as 600 years ago, and it was given to us as a gift in 1697 
by a London parish church to commemorate the fact that William Penn had been baptized at this font in London. We've had it since 1697 and we have used it since 1697. Walter, let me show you one of our greatest artifacts. And it was made for the first structure on this site. It is, in essence, 50 years older than the Liberty Bell. It was made by the same foundry that made the Liberty Bell. It works beautifully. And what we want to do with all our history at Christ Church is find ways to use it. Think of the structure of the institution as a contemporary of Independence Hall. By necessity, they must be a museum, and by necessity, we must stay active. I'm so excited to have Diana, my pastry chef from the City Tavern here. Diana, so great to see you. It gives me a chance to finish this unbelievable meal that you prepared in honor of Christ Church. And Diana, what are we making? Blanc mange. And today we're using vanilla bean, which you call? Black gold. So we're gonna start with a medium-sized pot here. Add our cream into the pot. You know, I love to cook my cream and I taste the fish too. You should know that. Of course, it's the only and way. there's nothing better, more flavor. Cream is just so spectacular. We're gonna balance it with a little whole milk, so still a good amount of fat in there, but obviously makes it very, very white and decadent. Split two vanilla beans here, slice it in half, open it up, and scrape out everything that we can, and it's gonna go right into the pot. Don't want to leave any behind, so much so that we're just going to toss the pod right into the pot. So now we just need to get this simmering, not, not really even simmering, we're just going to scald it um, just to get the cream a little bit warm and help that vanilla soak into the cream. So we have some rum in that bowl over here. Oh yes. <laughs> a popular 18th century ingredient, a powdered form here. We're going to gently sprinkle it over the top and it's going to start to bloom, which just means get it ready to be added to something hot in order to get it to set when it's cold. We'll try to keep it in one even layer. Rum ruled the 18th century, you know that, right? Oh, yes. So this is going to set for about 10 minutes, which should make our cream just at the right point to have extracted all of that vanilla flavor. So we'll set this aside. Our gelatin is perfectly set and ready to go, as you can see. Yep. Push on it nice and squishy. Ready for the bain-marie? Yes, bain-marie over there with simmering water right on top. You don't want the water to touch the bottom of the bowl. You just want to gently let that melt. Otherwise it wouldn't sit up later if we dilute it. Okay, our cream is nice and warm, and I'm just gonna stick my finger in it as proof. Just warm. We have just a little bit of sugar here that we're gonna add in. Honey from the estate. That's right, lovely Harriton honey here. Drop it in and that'll lend Obviously sweetness, but such a nice background flavor. It's just not the same as sugar. Can't compare it. So lovely. We're gonna stir this just a little bit, and we're gonna set it back over nearer to the fire again, just until the sugars melt. All right, the gelatin is ready. Good, totally melted. We will bring both back over to the table. And now the two come together. So now we're gonna strain it into a glass bowl here. It's just to remove the vanilla bean. You could very easily just pluck them out, but I say why not strain it. Beautiful, no? Gorgeous. And then you just let it sit up until it uh, congeals and decorate it, correct? That's right. It's as easy as that. So you would just wanna to toss these in the fridge for a minimum of two hours just to make sure they're set and it sets pretty gently. And like you said, you can use any mold, any size, just give it enough time. So over there I have some that have been pre-made and set for an hour or two, so they are fully ready to go, decorated lovely with some fresh berries. Let's see. Mm. So simple. It attacks your palate mm. and it's in perfect harmony, balanced with cream, with honey, with sugar, vanilla bean. It don't get better than that. What a fantastic way to end this great episode on Christchurch, all for a taste of history.